May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. For as long as I can remember, I have been afraid of tornadoes. When I was a little girl, my family lived in Terre Haute, Indiana, which is on the western edge of the state, not far from the Illinois border. I must have been five or six when that part of the country was hit by a slew of tornadoes. Night after night, my parents would hurry the three of us little girls down into the basement, where they would try to lure us into going to sleep until the all clear sounded. But they told us, if we heard what sounded like a big train coming, they'd wake us up and we would all huddle together next to the southwest wall of the basement where we'd be safe. Trauma affects children in different ways. But in my family, it made us all vigilant about one thing or another. For me, it's been the weather. When my husband and I lived in Florida, I watched the tropics from May to the end of November, hurricane season. I watched the storm track predictions as they came in to see where the worst part of the storm was most likely to hit. No matter what the forecasters said or when they said it, no one knew for sure where the storm would make landfall until the storm made landfall. In the Bible, disaster prediction was the purview of the prophets. A true prophet was the one who got it right. A true prophet was called by God to deliver warnings that no one wanted to hear, warnings few would heed. Last week, we heard what it was like for Jeremiah to be called by God. He'd been made into a laughingstock because the Lord had told him to tell the people of the violence and destruction that was heading their way. He's weary and he's wearing down, but every time he's tempted to just hang it up and stop speaking in the Lord's name, he gets this burning in his bones and he knows he can't stop. A false prophet, on the other hand, tells people what they want to hear, even if it's wrong. In the Bible, a false prophet is always more popular than the true prophet. False prophets often taunt and humiliate true prophets. They make them look stupid or out of step with reality. False prophets even say that the Lord has told them what to say, so people should listen to them. Before people disputed the findings of science, they disputed who was speaking for God. That's exactly what happens just before we get to today's reading from the book of Jeremiah. A false prophet who goes by the name of Hananiah says that God has spoken to him and that God has told him to tell the people that things were going to get better, not worse. Now you have to understand that God's people were in the middle of a disaster. Their enemies, the Babylonians, had stolen their sacred vessels and kidnapped the son of their king. In the midst of this calamity, Hananiah is saying that he's going to bring the Babylonians down himself. He's going to get their sacred vessels back and all the exiles in just two years. And to prove his point, Hananiah takes the wooden yoke that Jeremiah is wearing as a symbol of his obedience to God and throws it on the ground. That's what I'm going to do to the king of Babylon, he says. I am going to smash him and his kingdom to pieces. Now in today's reading, Jeremiah issues one of the mildest rebukes of a false prophet that you will find in the entire Bible. Instead of debating Hananiah, instead of pulling out the charts and showing him the odds that the Babylonians were going to wreak destruction on what was left of their land and their temple, odds that were about 100 percent, 
Instead of telling Hananiah and all the people that God had told them it was going to take 70 years before the Babylonians were defeated, Jeremiah just says, in effect, I sure hope you're right. He's not going to waste his breath repeating what everyone has already heard him say. Jeremiah isn't going to divide the people of God any more than they are already divided. When you're in the middle of a disaster, that's the last thing you want to have. People fighting over who's right and who isn't. Jeremiah isn't going to weary the people any more than they are already. Because when you're weary, you start losing your faith in God and in other people. Jeremiah just doesn't take Hananiah's bait. He doesn't get sucked into Hananiah's drama. He looks down at his shattered yoke, lying there on the ground, and he says, Well, Hananiah, if you're right, everyone will know that you're the true prophet. We'll all know if what you're saying about the Babylonians being defeated in two years comes true. Well, it's not hard to see ourselves in the story today, is it? We are in the middle, some say just the start, of an unfolding disaster. And our country is divided over whether to wear masks or not. Our officials are weighing the risks of restarting the economy against what we now can see was an inevitable surge of cases. Those of us who have been staying home and staying safe are chomping at the bit to get out again. But it's even less safe for us to go out now than it was back in March or April. And there's the weariness, the weariness, the weariness from endless insults and provocations and the forecast that it keep extending this pandemic further and further out in time. Today's reading from Jeremiah asks us, how do we want to live these days? There's a part of me that wants to see the true prophets of coronavirus vindicated, the ones who warned against reopening too soon. And yet, I find no comfort, no peace, in seeing cases surging where they are surging. There's more to life than sitting on the sidelines and judging who is right and who is wrong about a virus that we can't control or defeat with words alone. This past week, I put myself in Jeremiah's audience and I thought, maybe I have been getting too caught up in the drama of who's right and who's wrong. Maybe there are fights not to fight right now. I already know the course I am going to follow, the course I hope most of us are following, to stay safe, as safe as we can. Maybe it's time we look for and cultivate what we and the people we disagree with have in common. Our differences do not have to separate us from one another and from God. We don't have to go along with those who want to make everything political or divisive. If Jeremiah can turn aside Hananiah with a shrug and a wish for the welfare of all God's people, I can stop being upset with my neighbors who don't wear masks and don't keep social distance. I can use that energy for other things, life-giving things, like planting a garden, checking in with people, celebrating those happy days long distance, and helping plan alternative ways of building community when we can't meet in person. And I can take all of this all of this to prayer. God has not abandoned us. When we are the most broken, when we suffer unspeakable loss, when we are lonely and our lives are full of doubt and despair, that's when God is closest to us. That's when we can lean on those everlasting arms. 
That's when we are given the grace to carry on and the love to see it through. Amen.